communist armada rolls into place. Spring, 1975. It is 30 years since the first shots were fired in the Vietnam War. Now, two years after America's withdrawal, a final offensive is about to begin. It will take just 55 more days to end the 10,000-day war. January 1973, the Paris Peace Treaty is signed. Under the treaty, only 50 U.S. military advisors remain from a one-time force of half a million. The main compromise allows Hanoi to keep 150,000 regular troops in the South and allows President Chu to remain in power. Although Congress forbids further U.S. military action, President Nixon gives Chu secret assurances that America will use full force if necessary. But in August 1974, Nixon resigns. In December 1974, the communist leaders meet in Hanoi. They decide upon a two-year program for military victory. Their immediate plan is to force Chu from office. North Vietnam's chief strategist is Defense Minister Bo Nguyen Jap. Even in Saigon, people are opposing Thieu and trying to overthrow him. You can't survive if you go against the people's will. The American imperialists thought even when they withdrew their troops from Vietnam, they would still continue to transform part of Vietnam into a new colony of theirs. Even now, if they deploy their air force and navy, they will fail again. The Vietnamese people do not fear such things. It is obvious that our people, in particular our countrymen and soldiers fighting in the South, have beaten the American imperialists. Chu is still totally dependent on American aid to maintain his army. But Congress wants to end U.S. support. As American aid declines, so does South Vietnamese morale. Since 1973, from the time we signed the peace agreement, until 75, our war potential has been reduced to 60% because of the cut of the economic and the military aid from the United States. And that, I say that the Vietnamese nation has uh, not been honestly done as promised by the United States. This is the main reason of the collapse of South Vietnam. In Saigon, there is still hope America will return. The capital is crowded with refugees. Almost half the country's budget is spent on defense, yet war equipment is not being replaced. Hanoi now takes extraordinary efforts to ensure a surprise offensive. The field commander, General Van Tien Zong, is sent into South Vietnam. But to remain anonymous, he travels part of the way by bicycle. Journalist Wilfred Burchett. They went to great uh, considerable lengths to guard, keep secrecy. Uh, they kept secret the fact that, uh, that Van Tien Zong had even gone to the south. They kept issuing birthday messages or congratulatory messages from Hanoi, <coughs> signed in his name, and his car went to the staff headquarters at the same time every uh, morning. And so at all levels, they were very conscious of the need for secrecy, and I think very effectively uh, kept the secret. Hanoi moves three armored infantry divisions around Ban Mi Tut in the Western Highlands. Though Ban Mi Tut is a strategic center, only 4,000 South Vietnamese troops are deployed there. 2 a.m., March 10, 1975. 
An artillery barrage opens the attack. Tanks spearhead the 25,000-man communist force. They encircle the city. By dawn, after four hours of intense artillery fire, North Vietnamese infantry penetrates the defenses. President Chu has no time to reinforce. On the first day of battle, most of the city is captured. By next morning, fighting ends. Half of the South Vietnamese soldiers surrender or desert. The first big battle of the final offensive is over. Now, in one of the most controversial moves of the war, President Chu abandons two northern provinces. He also decides to evacuate the entire highlands region and redeploy his troops further south. We have not to wait before it become too late, and we cannot do anything. We have to take the risk, a calculated risk, you know, because of the, the redeployment, the withdrawal, without the mobility, without the great firepower support, is a risk. But it's a must for us. The withdrawal from the highlands becomes a trail of blood and confusion. From the towns of Pleiku and Kontum, half a million soldiers and civilians flee toward the coast. Military authorities choose an almost unusable highway, believing it's safe from communist attack. They are wrong. The North Vietnamese fire on the retreat. It becomes known as the Convoy of Tears. Only 120,000, one in four, reach the coast where the panic renews. Survivors tell of babies and old people crushed by military vehicles and of children dying on the road from hunger. The withdrawal was rated one of the worst planned and worst executed in military history. has a domino effect. Province capitals begin falling at the rate of one a day. President Chu now asks for urgent U.S. military action. Washington's response is relayed by Ambassador Bui Diem. By the time I rushed back home, uh, half the country was lost already. And uh, I did say, frankly, to all my friends uh, that there is no more hopes from the U.S. side. It means that if the thing comes to worst, the American wouldn't come back again. So we have to think in terms of realities. In Saigon, strict censorship keeps hope in the headlines. Few Saigonese know the full military disaster. Publicly, Chu says his troops are holding. Hanoi, March 18th. North Vietnam's leaders savor their biggest victory since defeating the French 21 years earlier. They decide on a daring new strategy to cut South Vietnam in half. The main prize will be the ancient city of Hue, Vietnam's old capital and spiritual center. Within 24 hours, preparations for the attack begin. Wei's northern defenses are hit first. Then heavy 130 millimeter guns hammer the southern and western approaches. Now Wei is cut off from Da Nang to the south. On March 25th, after a three-day siege, Wei falls without resistance. The communist flag had flown here for 28 days during the Tet Offensive in 1968. This time, it will stay. The North Vietnamese advance continues almost unopposed as South Vietnamese forces break and run. At the first communist advance on Hue, the area commander orders retreat. 
Officers, then their men, abandon the city and its civilians. Their only escape route is the sea, south to Da Nang. In the panic, many troops drown trying to reach the boats. At Da Nang, there is a widespread belief that a deal has been made to abandon the city to the communists. Three million people try to flee south. As 35,000 North Vietnamese troops approach Da Nang, the South Vietnamese commander abandons his men. Other officers remove their uniforms and hide. The opening artillery barrage is enough to end resistance. 100,000 South Vietnamese soldiers surrender after being left leaderless. Da Nang falls in only 32 hours. Former Premier Nguyen Cao Ki. Now, for that final debacle, I have to admit that it's our responsibilities. Or to be exact, I should say it's Mr. Thieu's responsibilities. Bound me to it when it first started. Commanding officers ran first. In the Aiko area, Da Nang, commanding officers ran. Everywhere, commanding officers ran first. And all those commanding officers were appointed by Mr. Thiel. That's the first time the morale of the army was affected. Not affected because they have been just overrun. Affected since two years. Because everyone understands that the military act has been cut, the economic act has been cut. There's many signs that America have abandoned us. By early April, the communists control the north and center. There's new respect for the North Vietnamese field commander, General Zung. He is an outstanding tactician like his tutor, General Jap. Of this period, he wrote, we understood that time is strength and that an opportune moment is priceless. The US Army Chief of Staff, General Wyand, now visits Vietnam. He reports that Saigon urgently needs $700 million worth of arms replacements. But politically, this is impossible. South Vietnam's army is doomed. Military analyst Brian Jenkins. It was my belief that if that assistance were withdrawn, uh, that then this military machine that we had created in South Vietnam would indeed collapse of its own weight. Uh, you know, you've seen in, in the museums these these suits of armor that look very, very formidable. Of course, there's nothing inside of them, and if you give it a good kick, uh, the entire thing tumbles to the ground. And in effect, that's what we were creating in, in Vietnam. Behind the scenes, there is pressure on Thieu to resign in favor of neutralists. With most of his country gone, he tries to reassure his people. So I have been very uh, calm at that period. Uh, we have been overrun, but not all. One third of the army has been overrun, but not all. Uh, one third of the country, or half of the country, has been overrun, but not all. We still have uh, many more crucial area, and we still have uh, strengths. The only special American aid program is called Operation Baby Lift the evacuation of 2,000 orphans to the United States. It begins tragically. A C-5A, the world's biggest transport plane, crashes outside Saigon, and 140 children die. The disasters in the field can no longer be hidden. 
Saigon begins to strengthen its highway perimeters. The communist advance is almost two years ahead of Hanoi's expectations. North Vietnam expert Wilfred Burchett. Well, right at the beginning, it was felt that uh, for the first, uh, uh, the first season, offensive season attack, it would be good enough if they got to Da Nang, dug in there, consolidated and so forth, and then the next operational season went on down to uh, Saigon and the Mekong Delta. But it was the, the panic in Hue and the, the collapse in, in, in Da Nang and uh, the, the ease with which all these provincial capitals just fell one after another. And the fact that the, um, the um, Saigon command was unable to well, consolidate its troops, they were not able to withdraw properly and regroup, and uh, everything was done in a very slipshod and haphazard a fashion with very, very little morale. The only real battle was, in fact, at Swan Lok. Swan Lok is a small provincial capital only 38 miles northeast of Saigon. It blocks the main communist advance. Swan Lok is the last hope for those who believe an all-out stand can prevent military collapse. <laughs> April 9th, the North Vietnamese opened fire on Zuan Lak. But this time, there is no easy victory. The communists later called the fighting fierce and cruel. 40,000 North Vietnamese troops launch an assault against the city. They are repelled. The defenders counterattack. Anxious Saigon, the name Zuan Lak becomes synonymous with hope and heroism. The North Vietnamese decide to bypass Zuan Lak and strike at the next city, Bien Hoa, closer to Saigon. After a week, both Bien Hoa and Zuan Lak are outflanked. The defenders retreat. It is April 16th. For the North Vietnamese generals, the way to Saigon is open. They order its capture within two weeks, by May 1st. Hanoi strategist Colonel Ha Van Lau. The army units that had the mission of encircling and attacking Saigon only took with them what was necessary for the fight. Some advanced in convoys, others advanced on foot and ran and made 50 kilometers a day. They didn't even eat because it was the goal, the taking of Saigon, that was their first preoccupation. Saigon itself appears calm. But tension mounts as supplies of gasoline and other commodities grow short. <laughs> Refugees keep crowding in. Now the elite see no way out. Sincerely, I do not know what's going to happen next. So I'm, ex you know, I, I know that I'm expecting things, something, but I don't know what. President Hu is now under intense pressure to resign. His suggested replacement is neutralist, General Duan Van Men, known as Big Men. It's believed the communists might negotiate a coalition government with him. Senior CIA analyst Frank Snepp. Big Men was a self-proclaimed neutralist. He'd uh, uh, called himself a member of the Third Force. He had a brother or a cousin. There was some debate over this, uh, who was... Uh, a uh, high-ranking North Vietnamese political officer, a general. So uh, Big Men was the, the last American hope. Chu had to be got out of the way. On April 20th, U.S. Ambassador Graham Martin visits Chu. I simply went to President Chu and, and laid out on the table as clearly as I could marshal the facts as they seemed to me to be relevant to the situation, the military situation, what the other side had, what we had, the political situation, 
the attitude in his own administration among his own generals and expressed the conviction that while I did not believe myself that there was any possibility of such a transition, it was clear that some of his own generals wished to attempt it, but would not do so with him in position. The next day, April 21st, Chu resigns the presidency. As a caretaker government takes over, Chu is hurried into exile. And it so happened that it was my job to get Chu to the airport shortly after his resignation. And what a night it was. It was a, a starlit night. There were tracers out along the perimeters of Tonsonud, Tonsonud Air Base. Several colleagues and myself from the CIA, as well as the CIA station chief, uh, collected uh, limousines. I was armed to the teeth because I had visions of what had happened to Xiam in 1963, ordered out of the car, cut down by young Turks. It was rather amusing to think back on it because uh, we certainly couldn't have defended ourselves with the, the AK-47 under my seat, the snub nose 38 strapped on my hip. It was a great adventure. And I looked in the, the rear view mirror at Tew's eyes, and they were glistening with tears at that point as we, as we passed through the air base on the way to the airplane that was to whisk him out of the country. Tew leaned over the seat, and he said, thank you for all you've done. And it came to me, thank you for what? For the 50,000 American lives that have been given here in Vietnam. And I, I thought about saying that. But being the big uh, or the, the loyal bureaucrat I was, I kept my mouth shut, shook his hands. The man was crying. I guess he didn't need that final humiliation. He ran up to the airplane. There were cameras banging on various lapels. The suitcases were whisked aboard. And there was Ambassador Martin, immaculately tailored. He was wearing his horn rim uh, glasses, I believe, looking very much like a, a professor. Nothing like an ambassador bidding farewell to the last vest uh, vestige of the American experiment in Vietnam. Politically, it is over. Thieu boards his flight into exile, carrying a lasting bitterness toward America. They have abandoned. They have a, they, they, they have a sold out to us. They have a stab on their back, on, on our back. It's, it's true. It's clear. They have a battery. Now, over 3,000 people are leaving the capital daily. Embassies begin to empty. American personnel are preparing final evacuation plans. The rich and influential South Vietnamese have already gone. April 23rd, 1975. Communist forces less than 30 miles from Saigon begin an advance on all sides. Hanoi had calculated on a final offensive lasting perhaps two years, but only seven weeks have passed since the offensive began. The battle plan sends 100,000 troops hurtling at Saigon from five directions. Their orders are to penetrate and occupy Saigon within a week. The sounds of battle can be heard in the city. Hundreds of thousands seek escape. Many fear they will be executed by the victorious communists. Their only hope is the American embassy and an airlift to the United States. On the same day as the North Vietnamese advance, President Gerald Ford, in a speech in New Orleans, declares, the war is over. Today, America can regain the sense of pride that existed before Vietnam. But it cannot be achieved by refighting a war that is finished, as far as America is concerned. <laughs> A 
Hanoi's divisions race into position. Now there is no fear of American bombers which turn back previous offensives. The communists sweep through the rubber plantations east of Saigon. The South Vietnamese, greatly outnumbered, only briefly resist. Soviet-built amphibious tanks easily bridge the rivers, then roll along the U.S.-built highways leading to the capital. Infantry convoys mop up resistance in villages and outposts. Long-range artillery disables Saigon's main airport. The siege is fully in place. Saigon is encircled. Within the city, 30,000 South Vietnamese troops await orders, but many senior officers have deserted. Saigon has a new government. It appeals for peace talks and a ceasefire. This goes unanswered. Now, 72 hours remain until the end. Saigon's armor attempts to seal off the main highways. Tens of thousands of refugees try to board the last helicopters, leaving the city outskirts. But soldiers fleeing the battlefield commandeer the choppers and retreat into the capital. The refugee flood is greatest on the main artery from the east, a four-lane highway once the pride of American engineers. Civilians and retreating soldiers sweep aside checkpoints in their haste to escape the onrush of battle. For the communist forces, the main problem is the speed of their advance. The troops are moving so quickly, it is difficult to supply them. Southern guerrillas act as guides, providing maps and pointing out weaknesses in government defenses. By now, 20,000 communist troops are within 12 miles of the city. 30,000 more are moving in. In his dispatches, the communist field commander, General Zung, likens his forces to a divine hammer held aloft. Saigon's army, he wrote, trembled in fright watching the hammer descend. But at a key bridge called Dong Nai, on the main eastern approach, the South Vietnamese put up a fierce resistance. The bridge changes hands several times before the communists secure it. A major route into Saigon is now open to the attacking force. With three nights remaining, the communists intensify the fighting. Infantry and artillery assault the city perimeter, but here they halt. In captured areas, communist cameramen record the population tearing down symbols of their former government and celebrating in the streets. In Saigon, too, the streets fill. Here, the emotion is fear. The large Catholic population is especially nervous. Thousands gather to hear former Prime Minister Nguyen Cao Ki. He denounces his countrymen who have fled. Armed resistance can bring negotiations, he says. The best way is to hold the line in the military. Because if the collapse continue, disintegration continue, and then there's no need for negotiation. 
But the communists send a grim warning. Five rockets drop into a crowded Saigon slum, leaving 5,000 homeless. Now, fears of a bloodbath increase. The next day, April 28th, the ring around Saigon tightens. Saigon troops rush to the Newport Bridge on the city outskirts. North Vietnamese commandos hold the far side of the bridge. The bridge attack increases fears of a military showdown in the city itself. The communists broadcast demands for total surrender within 24 hours. The deadline abruptly ends hopes for a political settlement, and it activates evacuation plans for 3,000 Americans. With the Newport Bridge attack, Saigon's discipline breaks. As the army of South Vietnam makes a final stand, civilians loot the nearby American commissary. Deserting soldiers join in. Looting spreads throughout the city. It is the last of the old life, the last hours in the death of a nation. Communists now attempt to close the last main exit. Five captured planes with North Vietnamese pilots bomb Saigon's Tan San Nut airport. A few hours later, long-range shells and rockets wrecked the airstrip, leaving no choice for Ambassador Graham Martin. And I picked up the phone and um, told Secretary Kissinger to inform the president that I had decided that we would have to go to option four to the helicopter airlift for the, for the remaining Americans and for such Vietnamese as we could get out. Waiting off the southern coast is an evacuation task force of three American aircraft carriers with support ships and combat marines. Noon, April 29th. The final exodus is about to begin. The ballad, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, is the code signal for the final American departure. As it plays over the American service radio, officials, businessmen, and journalists gather at the embassy. Some Americans have spent a decade in Vietnam. They have only hours to leave. Thousands of Vietnamese try to join the evacuation. They threaten to overwhelm embassy guards. For years, the symbol of a wide-ranging war, the helicopters can now only land on the embassy roof or in its secluded compound. Hundreds of Americans and Vietnamese officials wait in priority groups. The Marines briefly return to Vietnam to keep order. Some embassy staff spend their last moment shredding documents. Each chopper takes an hour to reach the evacuation fleet. Only a relative few can make it. One is former Prime Minister Key. I landed on the Midway aircraft carrier. 
and the admiral captain of the ship received me. And he left his office with his staff and just leave me alone. So I, I stood there for 15 or 25 minutes, just crying by myself. I, I couldn't stop it. Even I, I said to myself, oh, no, I'm a soldier. Never cry. But it happened. By now, hundreds of Vietnamese civilians are attempting to crash the embassy gates. Only the most persistent break through and get a chance to escape. In previous weeks, 100,000 South Vietnamese have bought their way out. But the sudden American evacuation still leaves behind many long-serving Vietnamese. Senior CIA analyst Frank Snepp. I was sitting by the radios at the top floor of the embassy monitoring the, the flow of intelligence as it continued to come in from various places. I listened to the radios, and I would hear people calling in over our radios, agents and employees who had been abandoned at various evacuation points. I'm Mr. Lon. I have served you for years. Save me. I am Mr. Ha. Save me. And there was no way to save them then. That, I believe, was the most tragic thing for me on that final day. The voices over the radios, and I still sleep. I have nightmares, and those voices still play in them. An alternate evacuation plan is departure from Saigon by barge. Though encircling the city, the communists make it known they want an uncomplicated end. They briefly delay their final assault to allow all Americans to leave. One of the last to do so, Frank Snepp. I'd gone out with the last CIA contingent. I got on the helicopter stumbled up the roof of, uh, up to the rooftop evacuation plan, got into the helicopter, and pulled in uh, several of the Vietnamese agents we'd managed to get inside the embassy walls. And the helicopter began lifting up off the top of the roof of the embassy, and the tail gunner was crouched over his weapon. The back of the helicopter was open, and suddenly green lights, radar uh, lights, began blinking inside the cabin and the helicopter arched up over the city. And for a moment, I could see framed in one of the windows uh, Mimi's Bar, one of the most famous bars in Saigon where many a, an American GI had lost uh, his shirt as well as his innocence. And I remember as we touched down on that deck, people all around me were crying. One Vietnamese woman we brought out was holding her child in her arms. We managed to get her and her child over the the wall of the embassy, but we'd failed to get her husband. Her life would be forever altered, and we had abandoned so many, we should have rescued and gotten out on the final day. On the last day, the helicopters ferry 7,000 to the evacuation fleet. Weapons are thrown overboard to prevent trouble. Dozens of helicopters flown by South Vietnamese pilots arrive uninvited. The $250,000 machines are ditched to make room for those still arriving. Ambassador Martin wants to extend the evacuation. Washington rejects the recommendation as too risky. 
I then drove to my house to pick up my wife. Uh, I think the Marine Guard uh, log showed that I was there for 11 minutes. She packed one bag and walked out. She had left everything that we had because, again, to provide this aura of stability, we had not packed anything uh, because the minute that we had picked up one thing to send out, it would have been known all over Saigon. Uh, so she paid the sort of a higher penalty than I did in the sense of losing uh, some of the treasured possessions of a lifetime. Martin is among the very last to leave. At 4.30 a.m. Saigon time, the senior American official in Vietnam gets a final order. This young helicopter pilot came into my office with this scroll on the back of a pad that um, uh, I never forget it. I mean, the name of the helicopter was the Lazy Ace, I think. Um, and the President of the United States directs that uh, Ambassador Martin come out on this helicopter. Well, what do you do then? I mean, do you try to emulate Admiral Nelson and put your blind eye out of the telescope, you know? I mean, you didn't hear, or you didn't get it. Or... And then for 45 years, I had been a, a disciplined officer of the United States government, and that I would not sort of spoil it in the end by any act of disobedience, and so I got on the chopper and came out. At 7.53 a.m., April 30th, the last American troops leave. 15 years of U.S. military presence ends. The communists converge on the capital in a five-pronged assault. They overrun Saigon Airport, occupy the military and police headquarters, then move through the garbage littered streets past a dazed population. The final hours are mercifully bloodless. A symbolic target is the presidential palace. A single tank provides the battle finale, storming through the iron gates. It is 11 a.m. A lone soldier runs forward to raise the communist flag. By noon, Hanoi's troops fill the city. Their flags are everywhere. At the palace, they arrest South Vietnam's last president, General Duong Van Minh. He is ordered to broadcast a message to his remaining troops. Lay down your weapons and surrender unconditionally. The communist field commander, General Zung, writes of these final victory hours. Our generation had known many victorious mornings, but there had been no morning so fresh and beautiful as this morning of total victory. For most of Saigon, the 10,000-day war ends with little immediate change. The black market reopens. Some soldiers from the north succumb to the temptations. Reforms soon follow. In Hanoi, the sudden victory after 30 years of war brings immediate celebration. Saigon is renamed Ho Chi Minh City, honoring the first president of North Vietnam. Prime Minister Pham Van Dong. We fought year after year in extremely hard conditions, which went beyond all imagination. Here, I would like to repeat President Ho Chi Minh's words, which we consider as a motto, a banner. Nothing is more precious than independence and freedom. In Saigon, the Communist Victory Parade is held May 7th, the anniversary of the French defeat 21 years before. Ambassador Ha Van Lao. There were a lot of emotions at that moment. Everyone could breathe again. The war was over. Peace re-established. 
And above all, we became the true masters of our own country, our own land, independent. Our first thoughts were of our venerated president, Ho Chi Minh, who was not there to see with his own eyes the most glorious moment in our history. Change comes slowly to Saigon. The communist victors initially treat the people with discretion. But the old regime is purged. 200,000 officials and military officers are sent to re-education camps. An estimated million and a half city dwellers are forcibly moved to the countryside. Within two years, the two halves of the country are officially unified as the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. The Vietnamese People's Liberation Army began as a ragtag assortment of volunteers. The Soviet-equipped North Vietnamese Army, which parades through Saigon, is the fifth largest in the world. This impoverished agrarian nation built up a military force exceeded only by the great powers. This force has brought America its longest and costliest struggle. As it ends, the majority of Americans express only relief that it is finally over. More than 100 countries give diplomatic recognition to Vietnam. President Carter is initially sympathetic to establishing ties. A U.S. delegation visits Hanoi in 1977 to pave the way, but nothing comes of it. The U.S. considers Vietnam too much under Soviet influence. The twists of history and the impact of prolonged war leave Vietnam as a shattered land. But it is one land. The Vietnamese are now one nation. <laughs>